Up next, we have a very special presentation. We bring to you our youth panel discussion, moderated by myself. As community members, we are aware of the systemic, deep-rooted biases and discrimination in our society. These are truly turbulent and unpredictable times. One of the most important questions that needed to be asked is, how do we make this country a better place? We now need to move forward and present solid solutions for reconciliation. To that end, we have assembled a group of extraordinary young people that reside in the Greater Toronto Region to address that very question. We bring to you our youth panel discussion titled, What Now? These young folks are our future, so we thought what better place to start than to ask them their thoughts on the current state of affairs. And I must tell you, I am incredibly humbled to have been in their presence and part of their discussion. I hope you enjoy it. Hello everybody and welcome to Moksha Canada's Afro-Caribbean Cultural Festival. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Neil Danny, and it's my pleasure to be the host of this panel discussion called What Now? Where we are speaking with youth and we're gonna be getting insights from them. I'd like to welcome our panelists, Chantelle Meyer, Roshanna Jade Alexandria McLeod, Brandon Burford, and Shanae Rodney, along with our moderator, Brianna Merritt. And Brianna is gonna take over the conversation very shortly, but just before that, I'd like to give her a little bit of an introduction and also just briefly introduce the panel discussion and the festival as well for those of you who are just tuning in. The purpose of this event is to promote diversity and inclusion by encouraging positive interaction between various groups. We also include indigenous peoples along with racialized women and vulnerable girls. And the goal is to work towards the elimination of discrimination, bigotry, racism, and prejudice. This event will also provide opportunities for family togetherness and youth involvement in this panel discussion, for example, through arts, culture, food, and music. And now it's with great pleasure that I would like to welcome our moderator, Brianna Merritt. Brianna Merritt is currently the bilingual training coordinator for the City of Toronto's Children's Services, Quality and Capacity Building Unit, responsible for creating and delivering educational, professional learning presentations in French and English to current childcare workers. Brianna has held this position for over three years and has over 10 years experience in the human services sector. Her career has focused on quality childcare, adolescent development, and adult learning, which has enabled her to develop a strong technical knowledge in the field of youth development. Understanding the racial, educational, and social barriers faced by disadvantaged youth, Brianna has been instrumental in supporting the French language sector in regards to professional learning and equity. In 2018, City Council approved the Toronto Action Plan to confront anti-Black racism and named Children's Services as the lead on a number of actions. Understanding Black communities' unique experiences, Black staff across Children's Services came together to ensure that they provide appropriate programs and services to strengthen relationships between Children's Services and Toronto Black communities. Brianna is a member of the Children's Services Confronting Anti-Black Racism Strategic Advisory Circle and has supported corporate confronting anti-Black racism training for more than 400 children's services staff and is contributing to the development of the upcoming children's services what service plan so it is with great pleasure that i'd like to welcome brianna merritt our moderator hi thank you so much i'm so happy to be here and i'm so happy to be able to have this discussion with our panelists so i guess what i'll start off by saying is we're here for a what now type of conversation um given the current climate locally as well as globally the conversation needs to be had so what needs to be done and able to to be able to move forward i will welcome everybody and i will say that joining us today our community member panelists. We'll start with Roshana, a self-proclaimed avid learner, has completed programs such as chemical laboratory technician, pre-health science, and creative advertising. 
Roshana completed a 600-hour practicum at the Family Life Youth and Multicultural Center and created a program for racialized youth, providing them with the opportunity to learn life skills, gain peer mentorship, and to feel connected and be heard. Her goal is to complete a bachelor's degree in, in intern, oh, sorry, internal development and a master's in social work. Thank you so much, Roshana. I'm excited to have a conversation with you. Thank you for having me. Next, we have Chantel. Chantel is a writer, a speaker, and mentor who is very active in the Black community. Using her social media platform to support solution-based conversations, one of her goals is to help make financial literacy, natural hair care, and body positivity more accessible and inclusive in her community. I can't wait to have a great discussion with this young entrepreneur. Thank you. Next, we have Shanae. Shanae is a graduate of the Community Justice Diploma, as well as the Social Service Worker Diploma. Her focus is providing support to women who have fled intimate partner violence with their children as a woman's counselor. Shanae is dedicated to maintaining awareness, education, and action to identify and challenge social and systemic changes. Welcome. Thank you. Last but not least, we have Brandon. Brandon is a second year student at Trent University, aspiring to get a dual major in child and youth studies as well as psychology. Brandon is an aspiring teacher and is hoping to be able to support teenagers with intellectual disabilities um, and coaching basketball. We can't wait to see what the future holds for Brandon and thank you so much for being a part of this discussion. I'm honored to be here. So let's just jump right into it. This question is for every panelist. We'll start with Roshana. What is your take on the current state of affairs? What is happening around you with police interactions, with jobs and employment, youth engagement, and social systems? What is your take on it? Uh, my take on what's going on is that it's actually really sad. Um, the fact that as a society, we're so divided when we live in a multicultural country that prides itself on diversity and being inclusive to all. Um, I think the youth, speaking, speaking from you, a youth, uh, that we, we want to be heard and we're not being heard um, and that things are not being done. There's just a lot of conversation and there's no action. So I feel like um, looking around me, like it's like, like what now? Like let's, let's, let's start doing some, let's start putting things into action. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point in terms of stop talking, we need action. Yeah. We've talked a lot and yet nothing has changed. Yeah. For sure. Shanae, sure. what is your take? Um, I think my, I agree um, with my co-host that it's, it's really sad um, to see the world so divided um, and to see that our experiences are, of um, discrimination and oppression uh, as a people, uh, as a woman, is widespread uh, throughout the world, through systems, um, through jobs, through education. Um, I know that right now we're in a very divisive time where it's really a large conversation around what does racism look like? What are examples of racism? I think there's a lot of education and awareness that needs to be set around that. We need more allyship. Um, and we need to have more frank discussions with um, everyone from a vulnerable population to get their input. Um, and I think right now it's uh, because it's very divided. Um, folks don't want to be on one side or another, but I think it's important that in history right now that we take a stand and stand against systematic oppression. Yeah, and I like that you said in the education system as well, like this needs to be something that is taught early on, something that is able to be identified and that allyship and having someone to speak to in the school system as well. And also naming it because when I was growing up, I don't necessarily think I knew what it was called, but I knew something was happening. Yeah. So I, I definitely appreciate that. Yeah. Chantal. I think I think history is continuously repeating itself. Um, and I would agree with Shanae 
in terms of education being the foundation for everything. Like we need a whole system reboot, but working with what we do have, I think it's time we sort of shift how we're moving. Um, you know, I don't think it, it should be a matter of surviving or just living to survive. Like we need to start really progressing past just like the bare minimum. And I think education is the beginning for sure. Yes, it starts with education, but it is not the only avenue. So I agree with that of if we can diversify our por portfolio and be able to get into different things, then we would be unstoppable. And Brandon, what is your take? I actually think it's really unfair, right? Like, and it's actually ironic, right? Like me, like personally, like as I became a teenager and a young adult, it's kind of like I was kind of used to everything that was being thrown at me that was kind of unfair. It's kind of like you almost get used to it, right? But it's, on, it's only in around this time period that it's finally clicked into my head, maybe some of the things that have been happening in my life because of my ethnicity, because of my color, maybe that wasn't fair, right? So I feel like the world needs to continue. I feel like the last few months, there's been a lot of awareness spread around. You probably see via social media, like everyone's talking about it, but there needs to be firm action done. And it's like what you guys have all been saying, it starts with the education system. That's why I personally want to, I'm an aspiring educator, right? I want to help make that change, right? Because if we knock it from a young age and help little young people recognize it from a young age, maybe potentially it can stop in the future, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think also even myself with being able to now go into child care centers, I have never actually known to go into a child care center and really be able to see the biases of how, you know, the children, the black children, let's just put it out there, are treated versus the other children. And if it starts at that young of an age, I can only imagine how mm -hmm. it, it gets into everything that you do. So from childcare and then getting into that school system and then starting a job, it's there from when we're young. So the next kind of topic is what do we do? So what needs to be changed at a systemic or institutional level to be able to achieve what we think is a fair world? Let's start with Chantal. Okay, so I personally think that um, we, need, we need more Black teachers. Um, we need more Black teachers who can relate to the Black kids, who have more compassion towards what they're going through. You know, um, there's a lot of violence within schools. There's a lot of discrimination. Um, it's plain and simple that, you know, Black kids are not treated the same. And I feel like if the teachers look like them, it's just easier to relate. They'll be able to relate to home situations, um, provide better solutions that are, you know, unique to that person. Like the education system is very one size fits all and, and that is obviously not working. So I really think that there needs to be more diversity within the teachers. Um, there needs to be more diversity in the learning, um, in the teaching methods and um, I'm really glad that all of you seem to have a really great educational resume and that some of you are into teaching or already teaching because that's where the change starts. Like we need to start going back to the places that, that aren't working. So if it's at schools, jobs, politics, it's not working, we need to be there. And I know that you are focused or a big advocate for financial literacy. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about what financial literacy would look like in a school? Sure. So um, I really only started learning about financial literacy, um, which is really just understanding how money works um, in the last, I want to say, six months. And in, that, in those six months, like my life has changed in all aspects. So it's really just understanding money, understanding how the banking system works. And I think that kids should like know that and learn that from a young age, starting from, you know, they get their little chore money, what to do with that money, 
like those kind of things develop from a young age literally change your life like i just turned 28 and i'm just learning about these things it's like i'm set back so many steps because of that so if we start to implement that in the schools um again just saving tips learning you know the credit system in high school like you should know about credit cards in high school because guess what you're going to be in college a couple years down the line and they're going to be throwing these credit cards at you and you're not going to know what to do or how to properly use them so i would say the most basic steps of saving investing um banking should be taught in i would say like middle school that sounds safe i guess Good. And I'm, I'm happy you were able to share that because I think, again, getting that word out and getting that awareness and I saw Brandon nodding. So, Brandon, did you have anything to add on to that, especially as an aspiring teacher? I love that. Right. That's not something I ever personally thought of. Like you're the first person that ever brought it to my like awareness. But that is like a lot of people in their young 20s do struggle, especially like I find in our community do struggle with like I'd say financial literacy right so i feel like if you have like that foundation from a young age and you're right it would start from that chore money at a young age what do you do with that chore money do you go to the store and buy candy or do you save it do you invest in it right so like i that's cool i really really i really enjoy that i appreciate that so Roshana, let's get back to what systems need to be changed for us to be able to move forward in this kind of solution-based what now conversation um, I think going like institutional wise, uh, the government, like policies and procedures, um, I think the awareness of pr uh, privilege, like understanding what privilege means and what that looks like in yeah. Canada today, not a couple of years ago, like today. Um, it's important that they, the government understands like it started a lot of it starts with them like we can't push forward if they're not listening to us um yeah <laughs> i definitely think the government is an institution that we definitely need to look at and um get make changes definitely make changes there yeah and so shanae i also see you nodding did you want to kind of add on to that as well Yes, I do. Um, to add on to what she's saying, I also think, you know, as an on an educational level and making policy changes, we need to be able to recognize privilege seriously, like having a conversation about what white privilege is and what white fragility looks like. Um, I know it's an uncomfortable conversation, but the conversation is not based around comfort. It's based around real life. And we know that social determinants of health are factors that influence our quality of life and how things are going to turn out. Race and gender, okay, are two social determinants of health. As a woman going through the women's suffrage over the years, women just, you know, getting rights to vote and being able to work, there is a lot of even, you know, division between folks in the Black community. Like being black is one thing, but being a black woman is another thing. Being a black person and then you're part of the LGBTQ plus community, an older adult, at, use, at, um, at risk youth. Each of us, yes, we are oppressed by these systems that continuously look down upon us as if we are second class citizens. You know, you can't walk into the bank because you might not look the part to get a loan. What does looking the part mean? What do you have to do to prove that you're, you know, worthy of recognition. I don't know if worthy is the right word, but what do we need to do to show that respect needs to be given? Recently, like yesterday, a young man in America that got sh shot seven times, you know, in front of his four children, of course, that's not okay. It makes my heart sad. It makes everybody cry. And we see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things happening everywhere in the world. We can't help but feel a connection because that's a black man. That could be our father. It could be a grandfather. That could be our son. This is our reality. And still folks are going to come out and say, okay, there's no racism because, you know, you know, people aren't saying the N-word or people aren't doing this. People need to recognize that racism is aversive. That is exactly what racism is. Getting shot in front of your kids. There's no innocence until proven guilty. Defiance means that you get to be killed. 
And folks are justifying that saying he had a criminal record. Now we're having to defend why black people are good people so that they don't get shot. I think we need to look at the, the power dynamics and the systems that continually perpetuate hate and, and divisiveness and separation. And it starts with having a conversation about white fragility and the unconscious bias that is there. Yeah, and I think about the language being used, you know, we always yeah. have to tiptoe because I think white privilege is a triggering term where as soon as you say something, they say, well, I wasn't privileged, I didn't grow up privileged. So it's just about the understanding of what it actually means and having those uncomfortable conversations, but they need to be held or they need to be had. I mean, for me, especially, I know that where I work right now at the city, I mean, why did it take us how many years to even start these conversations. Right. So I can imagine everyone else growing up, it's if I didn't work for the city, would I even be exposed to having these difficult conversations? Mm. And they need to be had. I also think that it, it comes from like the household too. Like it, yeah. parents need to be more aware and actually just educate themselves on what this looks like and kind of pass that down to their kids. A lot of it, it does stem from home. Like uh, there's so much we can say to these to person of white privilege but until your home and let's say my parent your parent is, is telling you like this is what it looks like this is what it means mm -hmm. this is how you kind of like we're going to push forward through it I didn't understand it and not acknowledging that you know they may have done wrong in the past by not understanding and like kind of putting their impressions on their children but mm -hmm. um bringing that conversation home like let's let's talk about it let's talk about it in our communities let's why like why are we why is it a touchy subject like everything we talk about nowadays is touchy so what's the difference between this one, <laughs> this conversation yeah I think it's always going to be touchy when it's made around comfort um and made around how comfortable folks are made to feel and like that in itself is just completely oblivious to the fact that that right there is, is privilege. You haven't really earned, it's the unearned um, assumption and the unearned privilege and unearned access that you can just simply um, be a certain race and all of a sudden that's, that currency is enough to get you through life. We look at Donald Trump. Oh yeah. <laughs> definitely Everything a currency. Yeah. <laughs> right, that's it. That's all you gotta say. <laughs> And he's been the president and actually, you know, he, his campaign manager, his campaign advisor, they're all indicted. They all have criminal records. So what like black people are, people of color who have a criminal record are not the right kind of criminals. Like nobody can make a mistake. It's all based on, you know, how close or how far it is to what you deem is okay. I think that's a part of the problem. And seriously needs to start at home. And again, as you guys were saying in the education system in terms of what that looks like and, and what kids are unconsciously being taught in school. Mm -hmm. So Brandon and then Chantel, I mean, how are you able to even navigate these systems that we feel are not working for us? How have we been able to do that? Because I think this panel is a great panel. We're diverse, we're educated. So how were you able to, and I'll start with Brandon, is to navigate the system that doesn't work for us? Me personally, how I've been able to, I guess, um, deal with it. I've had to work extra hard my whole life, realistically. And to be honest, even, um, I feel even though I've worked hard, I feel like I've had, like, there's been positions that I feel like I've already should have earned, right? That I'm still working for, right? It's an ongoing process that is something I've just learned to deal with, but it doesn't never break, it never personally breaks me down. It just makes me more hungrier, right? Um, I think I was introduced to kind of just want to be a teacher. My final goal is actually my MBA, right? So like my my whole life, my, my mother has told me growing up, you got to work extra hard. You got to work extra hard. I'm 24 turning 25 now and that's that's instilled in me. So that's kind of how I've gotten by every day. And yeah. And Chantel, what about you? I think it's a different experience. I do want to acknowledge um, light skin privilege is real. And um, I, I can't say my experience is the same um, as other Black folk. I can't say that I've 
had overt racism placed on me. Um, discrimination, yes, but it's it's minuscule. It's minuscule compared to to my darker skinned brother and sisters. So um, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Um, I definitely. I definitely feel differently in the sense of I know that when I walk outside, I'm, I don't feel like a target and that's horrible, but um, I think that's also a conversation that needs to be had within the black community is that it's, it's a different experience and um, the way that I am using my privilege is um, trying to educate others on colorism. Um, I try to open up space for, um, for black folk who don't have the same experience as me and um, just using my voice. You know, I really, I really am passionate about motivational speaking. Um, I'm very passionate about progressing the black community and I just do my part while making space for others, so. And I think everyone right now on this call is doing their part, even though you, you know, you're taking part of a town hall discussion. That is the first step, um, in my opinion, to be able to use your voice in a powerful way and to be able to impact and touch other people as well. And I, I completely agree that everyone's story is completely different. However, sometimes we do feel the same. You know, we're, we're Black. I can't forget that I'm Black. The world does not let me forget that I'm Black. So how do we move forward with that, knowing that the world sees us as Black? I guess I'm gonna jump into the conversation about the police. So I know that the term defunding the police is out there. I kind of wanna get your opinions on being young people moving forward, trying to navigate in this world. What does defunding the police mean to you? And so I'll start with Brandon. What does it mean to you? I believe like defunding the police, it's tricky because when you say it, like a lot of people, I guess, don't really understand what it means. It's not, it's actually what you explained to me, right? It's not what it, um, it's not like, um, it's, it's not taking away money to, from the police, but it's moving it to other resources, other resources in the social services, the education sector, right? Um, I feel that would be good, right? Because when you have, um, police officers like pulling up for situations, right? That realistically should be handled by a social worker, child and youth worker, something along those lines, right? It doesn't really, as we can see, it doesn't really end up well, right? So I really do feel defunding the police would be something wise that Ontario and actually the rest of the world should really look into. Thank you. Janae, how about you? Um, I agree with Brendan. I think maybe moving or allocating funds other places in the police department that focus on awareness, education, uh, clearly de-escalation training um, would be highly beneficial, um, and other means of training so that folks are not having to use lethal force. I think um, being able to recognize and train um, your police officers every so often, maybe every you know quarterly throughout the year or something like that, would help them to really um, get used to, be familiar with, and learn different avenues and how they can you know de-escalate a crisis. Um, I think they need to fund uh, other social workers and um, mental health workers that need to go out um, on a call with police um, to respond appropriately to the needs of the caller. Um, like for example, that young woman that was on the news that had the altercation with police and then all of a sudden she ended up dying on um, a balcony and then death. And then there's just so many questions in between there. Like for example, if she was barricaded inside, like why were there multiple officers in there? That can certainly heighten the crisis. And I know, cause I specialize in crisis intervention. I do it at my job at the shelter and I also do it on the crisis line um, slash suicide line. So I understand that, you know, going into a crisis, you need to be aware of what is happening and regain control. And certainly, you know, presence of multiple police can be intimidating and it's especially triggering for folks in the black community, which I know some other groups might not understand, but you know, that in itself, um, can cause a problem. So I definitely think moving the money around um, to other areas to help them to be able to um, assess the situation and respond correctly is what defunding means uh, for me. 
Great. Roshana. Um, I agree with everyone else. Um, I think it's, it, it would be a good idea to defund the police. I mean, they are still going to be there to protect, but putting that money elsewhere to programs that will either build up the community, build up our youth, um, so that there aren't as many violent issues in the, in the cities and streets. Um, putting that money towards edu education, yes, 100%. Um, training, as Shanae said, for the police, uh, de-escalation, those are super important. I mean, as a recent graduate of the, the social service worker program, there's just not enough places for us to go to help. So like, I feel like putting more programs in place where, you know, this is what we've done. Like we're trained to, to help in these situations, give us the opportunity to do that. And then those funds would help. It's just like a lot of places don't have money to support the roster that they need, or they don't have money to um, give the community what they need. So then what's the point? Um, so 100%, I agree with defunding the police. And Chantal. So um, I'm just a firm believer on like scrapping everything and starting over. <laughs> like <laughs> honestly, like the 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 core of police as we know it is violence, and we need to just shut that down like completely. Um, it needs to be. Honestly, anything that benefits the black community will benefit everybody. I stand on that. I really do. Like if we look at the, the, the poverty, the oppression, the racism, if we solve that, everyone will win. Like solving these things is not going to put white people back 400 years. So I really think that defund the police to me means um, equal funding or at least just allocate it differently, but also restructure like the core of it which is violence um i think that you know wellness checks should be wellness checks like if someone is expressing that they need a wellness check why are you sending four cops to their door um and and i just i don't know but definitely um more social workers and and um people who can help de-escalate the situation need to be present in these situations. Like if I don't call the cops, I don't want you showing up. You know what I mean? So definitely change how the system works for cops and um, reallocate the funds elsewhere. Back into healthcare. Healthcare, mm -hmm. yeah, healthcare, all, all facets of healthcare, whether that's, um, I feel like social work can be considered healthcare um, actual health care, whether that's hospitals, nurses, all of that stuff definitely needs more support. Yeah, I agree with all of you and everything that you said. I think when we look at what defunding the police actually means, it just means reallocation of funds. And so in order to actually get that transformative change to a system, you need to reallocate the funds, pour it back into the community with the mental health resources, with the social workers. And, and I think transparency is key because exactly like Shanae said, when that young lady um, fell from the balcony, there's still so many questions. And I think that's where you get the distrust is it's not transparent. We don't know how your system functions and we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Good. Could I add one more point? Of course, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I just want to give you guys just a recent example of um, something that had come up when I was on the crisis line. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about education and educating folks and bringing awareness to these issues, um, you know, sometimes, and, and this is a part of white fr fragility, is that sometimes the unconscious bias is there and folks who would normally identify and say like i'm with equality i'm with black lives matter i believe in you know fairness for everyone don't understand the inherent racism that they may display so i had a caller that called in on the crisis line uh, and she was in crisis because um some young folks had moved into her building 
um, she had never been worried about this problem before, but the young, young folks had moved into her building and they were um, women of color. Um, and she's saying, okay, you know, they were making a lot of noise. They might be smoking, you know, marijuana. I don't want them around. I'm scared of what might happen. So when I was supporting her on the phone, I was trying to find out what exactly her fear was. She hadn't had an altercation with them. She hadn't had a problem to them, a problem with them as far as she was describing, yet still there was this fear there. So I was trying to get to the root of that. And then I was just asking, you know, you haven't met them before, you know, they might be okay. I'm like, you know, have you ever worried about anybody else in, in your building smoking inside? No, but you know how, you know, young folks can be. So I was like, okay, no problem. She's like, well, I'm not a racist. Um, if I lived in America, I would have voted for Obama, you know, because he was like the first colored president. <laughs> I'm not a racist. Immediately, hold on, I had to grab my ear. I, huh? I was like, immediately when I heard that, I was like, oh my goodness, coded language, red flag. She couldn't even say black. <laughs> couldn't even say That's black. <laughs> okay. She's like, I've lived in an urban neighborhood. Oh my gosh. I was like coded on top of coded. Like she couldn't, like, what is an urban, like, what is an urban neighborhood? Yeah. What is a colored president? Everything is based on her comfort and her understanding. And I'm, and I'm saying like, okay, you know, um, I, I actually was lost for words. And I was like, okay, like, I hear what you're saying. And she's like, I don't understand all these protests about George Floyd. You know, they said he wasn't listening to the police and you know how folks can be. Um, so then I just had to stop her right then and there. And I said, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to listen to this abuse of my intelligence and this clear, like racist rant that you're going on. I want you to recognize that you're talking to a person of color. You don't sound like a person of color. Oh, really? So what does the person <laughs> of color sound like? What is a black woman sound like? What does a black person sound like? Okay. So she's like, okay, I didn't mean it by that. Didn't mean it like that. And I'm trying to turn around the conversation and turn it into an educational piece saying, you know, this is why Black Lives Matter is out there because of the words that are associated with Black people, because of the unknown fear of these Black women moving into the building, because of the unknown expectations of the negative and these hidden prejudices that cause you to automatically be fearful of something and you don't know about it. And then your first, the next thing is for you to get defensive. Okay, I, you know, it's just a moment of education. So you're allowed to be uh, um, defending yourself and you're allowed to be offended, but I'm not okay as a person listening to this. So I tried to use it as an opportunity to educate her. She, of course, hung up the phone. Um, that's fine. <laughs> um, and when I was trying to give her examples of, you know, President Trump, um, she wasn't hearing it. I didn't hear that. I said, oh, you didn't hear what he said about certain countries? Um, no, I didn't hear about that. I said, you didn't hear, grab them by the uh? No, I didn't hear that. So I said, well, did you watch all the coverage on CNN or did you stop after Obama got elected? I'm just, I need to know. Didn't make any sense. Just excuses on excuses. And, you know, I would consider her an educated woman. She has degrees. She has money. And, and, and according to her, that makes her not racist. And because she's educated, that means she can't be racist. So she wasn't ready for the conversation. And I think a lot of people in high places have that same attitude where if you ask them about it, they start to look at it as you're calling me racist. You're saying I'm a bad person, but they're not looking at the institutions that allow them to be great while, while we're being held back. So, and, and that's just like regular calls that I'm getting all the time. And I'm having to say, okay, you know what? Yeah, I'm not going to listen to this. Like you, you're free to call back or you're free to talk about something else and I'm free to go. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head and I think our conversation has always come back to education, but I think one of the solutions is taking the time to educate. Um, and you have to be very careful with this because I know sometimes when I was in a position of having to educate th these people so many times, yeah. I said, it's not my responsibility. Why is it my job to educate everybody around mm -hmm. me? <laughs> okay. why aren't they putting in the work and why do I always need to put in the work so I think if we do talk about what a solution would look like where does education fit in and how does it fit in to the point where we don't feel like we are spending all of our time having to educate the community when they should be doing the work themselves so I kind of wanted to ask now that we're talking about community and our friends and you know other people's experiences, the next question is really about how do you see yourselves as part of the future and what about your friends and how do you as your friend group think about moving forward and how do you deal with everything that's going on. So let's start with Brandon. 
how I want to be a part of the solution for the future. Yeah. Um, so basically, I guess ever since I graduated, graduated social services, like I've always thought of myself as having the potential to do that. Right. Um, I told you guys I work after school programs. Right. So I worked them in urban neighborhoods. Right. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Malton, Maxdale, right? So I just believe like being there, being a good role model, like what Chantel was saying earlier, being someone that like the youth can actually see, right? As a successful young or a successful black man, it may help them like miles in their mind, right? Like I remember even me myself in high school, right? One of the teachers was a mud black man with dreadlocks, right? And look at me now, right? So influence goes a long way and that's my part like how I feel I'm gonna be um part of the change one day I also aspire to go into politics one day right so hopefully that's one way I can also make another change as well and yes yeah I think you hit it on the head you're basically changing the narrative you are giving the community a different version you're saying you know what not all of us are like this this is this different narrative look at me Exactly. What about you, Chantal? Um, I think I mentioned earlier, um, anything that's not working, we need to get in there. So politics, teaching, um, even the banks. Um, listen, I don't knock anybody for wanting to be a rapper or an artist. I think all those things are great, but I think we should also want to do other things um, you know, in my friend group, I would say um, I have a lot of artist friends. So, and I'm an artist myself. I write poetry, you know, always support that. But I really think the pillars of society, which is the banks, education, politics, government, like we need to go in there. And you can do 20 million different jobs. You can be in politics and be a rapper. Like you can do all the things. Um, but I really think like we need to infiltrate um, the spaces that just don't have enough of us in it. So again, teaching, like Brandon, I'm so glad that you're in the space that you're in. Same with Shanae, um, Roshana as well. Like just, you know, I think that, that, like I think we're headed in a good direction because we're already trying to fill those spaces. So I definitely think trying to get in those positions of power, because I think we, we would use the power differently because like I said, what benefits the black community is gonna benefit everybody. Yeah, yeah, so true. Roshana. Um, I think personally for me, I wanna keep the conversation going. And in that, again, I, I wanna start an organization for racialized youth um where they're given opportunities and to just be an example um an example to other community centers and community just the community in general like i want to rebuild that connection as i mentioned i feel like society has driven us apart so far apart that we're all like me 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 when if we're talking about a community like let's think about a, B, C, and D, like all together. How can I do something to benefit this person that'll benefit this person? So I kind of want to start, I don't get involved in that. I don't want to say start it, but like be more upfront and the face of like getting this started. Like, let's put this work in. I'm ready to work. I'm ready to see change. I'm done talking. Um, we all have this story and I respect uh, what Chantel said, not everybody going into like music and showing our, our faces in other um, avenues and career paths and showing our youth that you can do that. Like it's possible and that, I mean, for me, I have, I've been in five different programs. I'm, I, I didn't stop at just one passion. I, I, I kept going and I, I wanted to ensure that I was covering all of my passions. I didn't let someone tell me, oh, you need to be a doctor or you need to do this. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do, but I also, have a passion in science. I have a passion in art. And like, I want to show that we can combine all of that. And then, again, my friend groups are very artsy and very business mind like and like starting their own 
businesses and it's inspiring because it's 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 showing that we're ambitious like we're here we're ready it's just listen to us <laughs> so yeah you listen to us and teach us as well. I think mentorship is a really big piece. So I think you and Chantel hit the nail on the head in terms of we need to be able to infiltrate those institutions and be able to go into places like the bank and, and work there. And I think we now are going to kind of ask the community to mentor us and show us the way so that we can do things like succession planning. We can, you know, move up and move forward in an organization where we're not just at the ground level and we stay there. Mm -hmm. I think mentorship is a big one. Um, getting those generations, the older generation to teach the younger generation, the older generation to listen to the, to the younger generation. We're all facing, yeah. as black people, we're facing this di discrimination. And yeah, it might be the same, but the times are different. This, the, the issues that us as youth are facing are a little bit different. And if our older generation and our parents are not understanding that and are just seeing like, what they saw and this is how it's supposed to be and this is how it was then we lose connection between the generations and then you have an older generation looking at someone who's trying and maybe not doing as well and saying you know what they're not trying hard enough or when i was this this and this age like yes. that mentally gets to you and it's like mm -hmm. okay i'm not working hard enough let me work harder so mm -hmm. for that older generation to be more encouraging and more patient and but like just get that connection going back again it's, it's i find that so important it's so lost for real yeah <laughs> yeah yeah you know what if i i'm just gonna just mention something actually that we discussed last week uh during the retired senior officer discussion and it's it resonates on a lot of the things that all of our panelists and Brianna, you as well, are mentioning in this discussion. Um, I loved hearing all your, your insights and your takes on all these different points of conversation. But one thing that uh, really stood out to me is, uh, Chantel, what you were saying about, you know, having people in the banks, having people in government positions, and also uh, what you're doing, Brandon, where you're going in to be a teacher. And, a lot of what, what all of you said really does come together really well, where Chantel, you were mentioning, you know, we see, uh, you'll see a lot of your friends are artists and maybe it's time to also take other paths. And I know myself being an artist, being a music producer, uh, a lot of times we feel that, you know, if I, if I do something else, people are not gonna take my music as seriously. They're not gonna think, you know, I'm a real artist or a true artist because I'm doing something else. But, that's that's actually something that's very different now maybe back before sure but these days everybody's doing everything and i think a really good example of that uh that you know when you were speaking that stuck out to me is uh there's a show on netflix rhythm and flow it's like a rapping show and uh i i love that show but the person who won d smoke amazingly gifted rapper and he's a school teacher and so you can see that you can be in those positions of influence even in education, but you can still be a gifted rapper and a gifted performer and you can pursue your passions regardless because in both those ways, you're making a difference for future generations. And I think that having people in leadership positions basically is something that we were talking about last week uh, with the senior officers, that having people in leadership positions is going to help send this message and spread this message even faster because from a leadership position this mentality and this thought process can work itself down to different positions and uh chief devin clunas actually from last week was mentioning that where he started on the path to becoming an officer because he said look i don't see enough people in this profession that look like me i don't see me represented enough in this profession and if the future leaders are going to represent for the future generations, that's going to help inspire the future generations, but also hopefully change the overall mindset. So I think what all of you are mentioning is, is really important. And uh, I just wanted to just include that, uh, what we were talking about from last week as well. Thank you. Do we have time for more questions? One more? Sure. 
Okay, well, I kind of just wanted to end on the note of what advice do you have for young people like yourselves for future growth? So let's start with Shanae and just kind of drop, you know, one piece of knowledge or one piece of advice that you would have for young people who are also growing up um, right now and they're experiencing this, which is a climate that I personally have never experienced before. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's, it's different. Yeah, for sure. I would definitely say just to piggyback on what everyone has mentioned, try your hardest to find a passion and don't feel limited that you might not succeed. Um, maybe your story is the story that inspires um, other people of color um, in our community to step forward. And, you know, you're going to face challenges along the way, but show up and show out. Um, in the school system, um, be there, be present. Don't, don't be intimidated by the resume. Don't be intimidated by what the staff may look like. Just know that maybe you could be extending an olive branch and you could be, be leading a path um, to reconciliation. Um, I would say don't limit yourself. Um, working in a shelter, I see lots of children come in, uh, women of color and their children, black women, um, Spanish women, Hispanic women from different backgrounds, women that have come here recently three months and their experience abuse and violence. And I take my time when I'm dealing with the black children or children of color, because I know that their struggle is going to be more. And I instill in them confidence that they can be and do whatever they want to do. And that if they're not hearing it enough, you know, we love them, we see them, we hear them. Um, and I think to touch on what folks were mentioning before, um, you know, talking to the older generation about what being inclusive looks like and maybe going to counseling, seeking help in our family dynamic and recognizing that we've been through generational and histrionic trauma. We need to talk about it and express the things that our parents are saying from a tough love point of view need to also be effective. Um, and we don't want to be limited and, you know, we know a lot of where they're coming from had to do with survival, but you know, now we're going to put on a face and step out and show up. So I would say definitely get your education, become financially literate, look into counseling. It can only improve you. It can't hurt. And definitely keep the conversation going and talk, 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 talk. Great. Chantal. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, it needs to be, there needs to be like a bridge between the younger and the older generation. Um, we need to stop this like us versus them thing. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, like things are very different. Um, and, you know, maybe the path isn't school, job, marriage. Maybe it's something completely different. And I think that, you know, everyone should be open-minded towards that. Um, I definitely think that pouring love into the young, the young Black kids like you know they 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 need it and um becoming a mentor and you know I'll, i obviously preach financial literacy you know just get get your your t's crossed and um yeah i would say and also work on yourself i think once you reach a really good level of self-love things are different and you move differently. So I would say trying to push that as much as possible. Um, and definitely, again, just be open-minded to a new, a new way of doing things. Very well said. Brandon, one piece of advice. One piece of advice? Um, okay, I'll give you a lyrical. Ignore the Critics, Just to Say We Did It by Kanye, right? the life of a young black person a lot of people are going to tell you you can't do things even though you're perfectly capable of don't listen to them you know how much time people told me not to be a teacher come on right um <laughs> yeah. ignore them keep on going do you know your path and you'll be okay that's my true like piece of advice i love that <laughs> <laughs> and lastly roshana um I would say be a leader and not a follower. I mean, we're told all the time, be the head and not the tail or um, know yourself um, or learn about yourself. Take the time to find out what you like and what you want to do and, you know, get guidance from your parents and the, and the older people around you. And as women, especially young women, look for someone to look up to, like 
look for that mentor, look for someone that's going to empower you and find your, I call it my tribe, like find your tribe of women that will hold you down no matter what, because as a young black woman in this society, it is, it's, it's tough. It, it, and it's, it doesn't look like it's going to be any easier, but we're going to stand strong. And I just, I really hope that all black youth, like, go for what you want. Don't, as everyone here said, like, don't stop at just one. Don't limit yourself. We are not a, a people that stops and that that's limited and that like, just keep going, <laughs> keep going. It's going to, it's going to get better. And it's only going to get better if we start connecting and talking to each other. Just keep that open line of communication. Yeah, and I, I would finish with kind of echoing everything that you four just said. It's advocate for yourself. And I think, you know, don't stop, don't give up. But I also think using the community resources that are out there and joining town hall meetings like this and networking and connecting and building those relationships and those connections, because those things are out there to help and support us. So I think when we build, I love that when we build our tribe, <laughs> we're unstoppable. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us today for this town hall um, panel discussion. I really enjoyed the opportunity to hear from you and please continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for that amazing discussion. Thank you to Roshanna, Shanae, Chantel, Brandon, and of course, our moderator, Brianna, for having such a great discussion and providing so many insights to the youth, but also to the older generation. And the goal is create that bridge of understanding. And for all those viewers out there who are watching, this is what it's all about. Get into positions of leadership, change for the future generations, and you can be the face of that change. If you strive to, to squash the stereotypes and, and go in those positions of leadership, go into politics, go into law, go into whatever it is that your passion is and pursue that passion because that is your truth. If you do that, you can be that inspiration for the future generations. They will see that there are people that are representing me. There are people that look like me. They'll see their tribe. And that's going to help push this dialogue that much further. And so thank you so much to all of our panelists once again for all your insights, sharing your uh, experiences, but also sharing your truth. Thank you again to Brianna for moderating this amazing discussion. And thank you to all of our viewers for watching. This was our second discussion for the Afro-Caribbean Cultural Festival. And this topic was what now? If you didn't tune into last week, we were talking about how to move forward uh, and sharing experiences from not only now, but the past. So for those of you who are interested in learning more, please do also check out our previous week's discussion. If you didn't tune in, you'll get a really good perspective on how things were before, how they are now, and potentially a way to bridge these two perspectives. But Overall, it's been a pleasure having this discussion and being a part of this discussion. Um, and the goal is to promote and raise awareness of the struggles that Black people are facing in their communities on a day-to-day -day basis. And if this is an uncomfortable discussion to have, things like white privilege, think about how uncomfortable it is to be in your position every day, to be going through the struggles that you go through every day. It's unacceptable. And a little bit of discomfort, you know what, if we have to have that dialogue, it's a storm, but there's always a rainbow after the storm. There's always calm after the storm. And that's what we're trying to get to. So feel, um, feel whatever you need to do to get this dialogue moving. You can be in positions of leadership. You can do whatever you set your mind to. And you can be the change for future generations. So thank you so much once again for tuning in to Moksha Canada's Afro-Caribbean Cultural Festival. We will be having our third panel discussion next week, but until then, thanks again and all the best. Take care.
I told you this festival would not disappoint. I hope you enjoyed everything you saw today. Please come back and join us for much, much more. There's more food, there's more music, there's everything that you want. Follow us on social media, afrocaribbean.com, and we will see you next time.